and it just was like a light switch, right? I was when I was in the woke movement, it was foggy, it was dark, it was clouded. I was angry, I was resentful, I was bitter, I was all these emotions, right? And then and then once once the cloud had kind of been removed, it <clears throat> felt like my eyes had been opened again. And there was joy and there was peace. Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry, and uh, today my guest is Edwin Ramirez. He is a husband and a father. He is a pastor and a fellow YouTuber as well. So we're going to have a good conversation about a number of different topics. Welcome to the show, Edwin. How you doing? Hey, brother. Thank you for having me. I'm doing well. Yeah, absolutely. I know we spoke uh, earlier this week on your channel, and that was a good conversation. I had a live audience, so that was always fun. Um, but why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and um, your reason for both pastoring and being on YouTube and uh, just kind of just flesh out who you are. Yeah, thank you, brother. Uh, thanks again for having me. So as you mentioned, I'm a pastor uh, of a local church here in Western New York, a uh, small congregation, I'd say between um, 50, 75, um, and then that kind of you know, goes up and down based on the season and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I uh, have been officially the pastor here at my local church for about a year and a half. Um, and then prior to that, I was filling the pulpit at this same church for about a year or so. So overall, um, about two and a half years, officially the pastor, about a year and a half. Uh, I think those numbers are right anyway. So along those lines. And uh, I am the husband of one wife, uh, Sarah, and we have four children, one with the Lord, so five in total, uh, four here on earth. We have a newborn, and uh, yeah, we're doing well, man. By God's grace, the Lord has really been kind to us, and uh, we, we homeschool our children, and uh, my wife is just busy working, but but we're on now vacation, right? So the, the, the school year is over with, and so the kids are really just enjoying the the pre-summer as we get ready for summer. So, um, yeah. And, and I think that's it, man. I've been on YouTube now for several years. Uh, we're going to talk about my, my story with being woke and coming out of that. And by God's grace, man, when, when I started my YouTube channel, uh, I, I wasn't woke. And if I was, I wasn't putting out woke content. I, I think I started really going in on YouTube about, uh, 2020, uh, maybe even 2019, trickling into 2020, uh, when a lot of the incidents had been taking place that we had seen when the shutdown took place and all that. And so, uh, by God's grace, man, there's not content on YouTube that I can go back, you know, or had to regret and repent of. Now, on social media, the other social media platforms, that unfortunately isn't the case. Uh, I I put a lot of uh, woke ideology on Facebook, particularly. And uh, had to uh, publicly repent uh, and and individually as well to some brothers that I and, and sisters that I uh, offended and posts that I'd taken down and things of that nature. So there's a lot of that that takes place when you uh, are converted from being woke to to not being woke. Uh, yeah. and, and so uh, thankfully it hasn't been as much as you know it could have been, and yet still there's some remnant of that of my past on social media as well. So yeah, right on. Well, I appreciate that. But uh, we've got a lot in common, actually. I didn't realize. I know you had a few kids. We homeschool. We've got four. We actually have also one that uh, is with the Lord. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot more we'll talk about later, about probably. But um, yeah, so why don't you flesh that out a little bit more? I guess, well, kind of expand a little bit. Why are you on YouTube? I know a lot. Of, I like to always ask people that. Uh, a lot of us have different reasons. But why why do you spend time on YouTube uh, and produce content? Yeah, that's a good question, uh, Richard. So I started YouTube about 2016, and th the reason why I initially started, let me say this, let me go back. I started the proverbial life 2016, oh. and that really started by blogging. Uh, and and the reason why I initially, you know, entertained this this public ministry of the proverbial life and eventually ended up being the podcast and started off as a blog was I, I just moved from Florida to New York. And in Florida, we had a church plant that we had done for about three years. 
And I was burnt out. I was tired. I was um, I was working a full time job <clears throat> along with ministry and uh, filling the pulpit. And, you know, in the South, there's this reoccurring kind of theme that's just a part of the culture where you have service on Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. And you just you just have this going on continually. And I was burnt out. I was tired. I was overwhelmed. Uh, you know, starting a church plant, new family. My wife and I started having children at that time. And so we just really we really needed a break. And I needed a break. And so we we went through the process of kind of stepping down and, you know, making sure that we left the right way and making sure that we had people that could fill in this this gap now that I'm going to be gone. And so and with that, we also wanted to be closer to family. And so we were either going to go to South Florida with another elder who had just moved um, out of out of town. And so we were either going to go there or we were going to go to Western New York where my mother-in-law lives and be closer to family in that way. And so we decided to go to Western New York. And so we did. We moved here and lived with my mother-in-law for um, about a year or so and then got our own place. And then, you know, and so in all that, uh, the question was, what am I doing with myself? Uh, I have gifts. I have talents. What am I doing? I thought that the only thing I could do is be a pastor. And so what do I do? And so that's really how the proverbial life came about. I wanted to use my communication, you know, skills and all that and communicate gospel truth and I also wanted to grow as a writer. And so, oh, okay, well, let's start a blog. And so we started a blog and started writing on various topics, you know, just one to practice, but then two to, to kind of share yeah. uh, my, my heart in, in these areas. And then uh, little by little, it started to go into people telling me, well, you should, you should think about starting a podcast. And so I looked into that and I think I started an audio podcast for a while on Anchor and then that transferred into YouTube and uh, really, the theme of the proverbial life initially was, you know, all of life, you know, all of Christ for all of life. I just yeah. want to communicate uh, Christ in every area of life. And then that kind of morphed into, OK, well, look to Christ, live wisely, leave a legacy behind for generations to follow. Yeah. And that's really what the proverbial life was. And so then 2020, um, fast forwarding, I'm no longer woke. And yet. I'm no longer woke, and yet there's a lot of woke issues taking place, and and I have experience coming out of that, and so I just started speaking on the crazy things that um, some of the well-known preachers of our day have said, and yeah. there was obviously and still is a lot of fodder, right? There's a lot of things to pull from it, so I just started recording videos, uh, and then I was on different podcasts um, with John Harris and connected with A.D. Robles, who was instrumental in kind of bringing me out of that uh, unintentionally. And so that's really how the proverbial life started from from its inception until now. And now why, now I'm kind of rethinking, okay, what is it that I want to do? Well, I'm, I'm a pastor now, so I want to encourage believers and I want to encourage the body of Christ. I'm a family man, and so I want to speak to fathers and I want to speak to uh, congregants and pastors. And so there's just a, a bunch of different things that I'm trying to implement and rethinking what does the proverbial life look like with the gifts and the time and the talents that I have. So that's still in the process of growth um, yeah. and, and, and focusing in on, okay, what do I want to do and what do I think would be most beneficial to those who subscribe to the channel? So that's where I'm at now. Wonderful. No, that's great. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> the... The woke stuff. Can you flesh that out a little bit more, just kind of secondarily? Um, what? So you were a believer, and then you started to be woke, as it were. You mentioned this before we started recording with rap and things. Why don't you flesh that out a little bit more for the audience and just help them see, you know, how that happened for you, and and just hopefully take some encouragement and, and other things along the way. Yeah, sure thing, man. Yeah. So as we spoke off air. Um, you know, I, I was officially woke prior to being woke, right? Prior to being a Christian, I was woke. And, and what that meant for me was, and, and I didn't have that terminology, but what that meant was I, I, I grew up in a, you know, um, uh, inner city as it were. I didn't grow up in the Bronx or any of the tri-state areas, but I grew up in Long Island. I was born in the Bronx. 
uh, but I was raised in Long Island and I was raised in a small town and yet there was um, gang activity that taking place and there were cops and there was, you know, uh, I, w- I went to a predominantly black school and there was maybe, maybe 1% white people. I mean, there was probably like five white people in my school, maybe, maybe, maybe less than that. The rest were, you know, Hispanic background, black background, Caribbean background. Um, and so, so my stepfather is black. I didn't know my dad, you know, um, and and so 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 I, I was kind of immersed into this this urban context, urban culture. I, I considered myself um, for many years black. I did, you know, because I, I, I was immersed in black culture, whether it be through the music, through my friends, the the, the lingo, the, the the just just the style, the flow, everything that, that was just my culture. And so, um, in in that environment, for me, in that environment, we had a lot of uh, talks about justice, and we didn't have the terminology that I have now uh, with with justice and all that. Especially from a Christian worldview, yeah. uh, I wasn't raised in the church, didn't go to church, didn't have any of that. Uh, and yet, so my mentors were Biggie Smalls and Tupac and Big Pun and Wu Tang and all these people from the rap culture. Yeah, and. Nas and et cetera. And, 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 you know, they don't have a biblical worldview, right. But they, but they have definitions for words like justice and injustice and racism and white people and cops and all these things. And so I was woke prior to officially being woke, right. Mm-hmm. It was just kind of the, the, the air I breathed, uh, as Robin D'Angelo would say, right. Racism is the air we breathe. Um, and, and so I looked at, um, cops as, pigs and racist and and that's 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 not appropriate you know uh a language i don't adhere to now right yeah. and, and yet that was that was my mindset then right white people are racist they're out to me they're out for me the system is against me um you know i'm i'm fighting against the the stream as it were right i'm 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 like there's this system that's oppressing me and i'm fighting against it so that was my mindset i i lived and thought as a victim i had a victim mentality then, then fast forward. Obviously, a lot takes place in between that. The Lord saves me, and and w- when I when I hear the gospel, I come to faith in Christ. I'm not thinking in those terms anymore. You know, yeah. I, I kind of lived life and moved on from my original setting in this urban context, and I had kind of experienced life more. I went away to to Bible college, and then I, I met my <laughs> wife, and kind of lived life, and I, I wasn't living in this this tight. Um, narrow box of victim mentality in my own Mm. little urban community. Right. And that was good for me. That was helpful. And yet there was still that uh, seed in the back of my mind. Right. Well, of course, you know, there's racism and and that is true. There is racism. And, And yet as, as a person of color, as a Hispanic person, as, or a Latino, however, you know, depending on the audience, you know, I don't want to be offensive (laughs) with Hispanic, Uh, but as a Latino, right. You think, Oh, okay. Um, I know that as a person of quote unquote color, that there's the system is against me. And I'm thinking in this way as a Christian inadvertently, just by default. Uh, So I come to faith in Christ. I'm a Christian now, not necessarily thinking in those terms, but still have that backdrop in my mind. And, uh, you know, I just want to worship the Lord. I just want to serve the Lord. I'm not particular about the kind of music as long as it's glorifying God. Well, then Somewhere, uh, I don't know exactly the date, it's connected to Colin, Colin Ka- Kaepernick and that whole thing, um, you know, the police brutality, the introduction of social media and it being uh, really highlighted with the police beatings and, and all these things that have taken place throughout the years. Um, you know, and then you have um, prominent pastors that are kind of speaking out against racism, right? And uh, now they're introducing it as racism in the church and you know uh-huh. whiteness and Robin D'Angelo comes along and all these different things that are coming along. Um, I started to embrace this worldview that I was accustomed to in my lost days when uh-huh. I wasn't a believer. But now there's a Christian spin to it. Now there's a Christian context. Right. So so now I don't I don't I'm not coming at this topic of racism from a worldly perspective because there are people like Tabidi Anabwili and Matt Chandler and, you know, um, uh, what's the uh, J.D. Greer and, and yeah. Platt and Ligon Duncan, all these people who who are, you know, really 
pulling on the thread that I had embraced as a child and a young adult in my urban context. But now these are people that I can trust theologically, uh, right? I mean, they're, nice. they're Calvinistic, right? They're um, confessional to some respect, depending on the individual. And, and they, they helped me in my Calvinism when I was young, restless and reformed. And so if I could trust them theologically, then of course I can trust them sociologically, right? I can trust them on these political issues and so on and so forth. So I really, I really bit into the, the fruit as it were. And, and, and I, and I embraced this worldview holistically and I was woke yeah. And now I'm fighting for justice and I'm speaking against whiteness and oppression and, and all these things. So that's really how all that came about. Nice. No, that's good, brother. Um, tell us a little bit more. So you just testimony in general, how you said you grew up not going to church. You grew up in an urban context. How did you come to know Christ then? Yeah. Good question, man. So it was, it was, um, <laughs> I, so I wasn't ra- I wasn't raised in a Christian home, and um, but I had this desire to want to be in the church when I was younger. I had uh, friends who kind of played the religious part. They went to church, but you know they were kind of doing their dirt outside of church, so they weren't believers. <laughs> yeah. um, but I remember wanting to um, wanting to read the Bible at an early age. But we didn't have a Bible in my home. We didn't wow. have access to the Bible. We didn't have access to any of that. In fact, the first Bible I owned um, was right around the time I got saved. I was about I was about 21 when I came to faith. That was the first time I ever owned a Bible. Uh, first time I, I had a Bible and really read the Bible. There was there was a Bible in our home, um, but it was a Bible. Oddly enough, it was hidden because it was a special Bible. It was like the uh, it was like a family Bible. Okay. And it was my grandma's, my father's mother. It was my grandma's. And, and it had like these pictures that you could tell it was like a Catholic Bible. It yeah. uh, had the Apocrypha in it and all that. But it was in the closet. And I remember uh, reading it or I remember looking at it and my dad kind of scolding me saying, hey, you know, like you shouldn't be messing with this. This isn't yours. This is wow. grandma's, you know, put it away. And so so I did. right. I, so I didn't really interact with the Bible or the pages of scripture. I never had my own copy until I came to faith at 21 or so. And really, man, it was a, it was a, it was a bunch of things that God used. Right. So I was, I was religious. Um, you know, I was like, um, I, I kind of dabbled in like, um, different black cults. I was involved in, um, like God body. I told you I was like, uh, in an urban context. And so, um, you know, man is God, right? The, the black man or the, the, the person of color, like you're, you're God, you're a God. Oh. And so I saw myself as religious and superior in that way. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to, to do the right thing. There was moralism, you know, involved in that and, you know, be respectful and, and, you know, and build, learn, build up my knowledge and, you know, and, and all these things, but it was, it was hypocrisy. I was lost. I wasn't a believer. Um, I'd gotten, and this is kind of the transition I see God w- was doing in my life. About the age of 18, 19 years old, I had made up a lie to my mother and father and said that, that I had been shot at, that me and my oh. friends had been shot at. Um, and, and that wasn't uncommon for them to, you know, it wasn't like a, a hoax or something that they wouldn't have not believed because it was common in our yeah. area. And so I told them that I had been shot at. And because of that, I wanted to move. I wanted to just start from scratch. And so I, I moved and they, and they agreed. My parents had gone through some marital problems at the time. Um, and so they kind of agreed, okay, that I think this would be best for Edwin to, to move with his aunt. And so I moved to Massachusetts. I had met a, I met a girl in Massachusetts who was, who, who had family who were Jehovah's witnesses. Mm. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm, I'm starting from scratch. I'm, I'm a religious person. And so now I am, you know, kind of entertaining the, the religious of Jehovah's Witness. What do, what do Jehovah's Witnesses believe? So I'm, I'm embracing that, and I come back. That relationship fails. I come back, and I'm a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, his family is Jehovah's Witnesses, and so he and I, you know, have this relationship where we are talking about the Kingdom Hall and all of that. Mm, wow. um, and I remember... Um, he and I, 
he and I were good friends and he and I would have these Bible studies. And, and there was, there was uh we, we would walk past this church that would say, Jesus is Lord. And we'd say, that's ah, blasphemy. You know, Jesus isn't Lord, you know, and just, just crazy stuff like that. And at the time I was working at a hospital, working as a janitor. Um, and I had, you know, hours from six to 10, it was like a part-time job. My dad had worked at this hospital. And so he got me the job there. Yep. And there was this preacher there that worked as a p- pastor. And he, he, uh, he asked me questions about God and about all this. And I said, oh, well, I'm a Jehovah's witness. And I'll, and I'll never forget this man. He smiled. He kind of smirked and he was a short guy, shorter than me. I'm, I'm five, six. And so he's about five, four, five, five short black guy. And he, he starts, he kind of gives this smirk and he had a gold tooth in his mouth. Um, and, and I just remember that image of his gold tooth and kind of smirking, like, you know, kind of the guy Marv from, uh, from home alone. Oh, yeah. uh, he, had that, he had that gold <laughs> yeah. tooth. That's what I remember. Right. And so he, he, uh, he smiles at me and he says, I ha- I got something for you tomorrow. And I'm like, okay, you know, like, why are you smiling for? What's so funny, you know? <laughs> but the next day he comes and he gives me, this kind of dates me, he gives me a tape. And nice. on the tape is his pastor preaching against Jehovah's Witnesses. Nice. So I'm like, oh, I, okay. So I, I go home and I pop this tape into the tape player and I listen to it. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, wow. this is crazy. Like, I'm... I, I'm, if this is true, then I've been believing a lie. Mm. So my friend comes, his name is Herbie. Still, we're still friends today. He's actually a believer now. My friend Herbie comes and I say, uh, I was like, Herbie, I was like, bro, you got to listen to this. He's like, nah, I'm not listening to that. That's, you know, I'm not, I'm not messing with that. I was like, bro, trust me, listen to this. Um, So he listens to it. And, and I said, bro, what do you think? And he's like, yo, if this is true, we've been believing a lie. And I'm like, it is, you know, and yeah. around the same time, man, um, providentially, bro, the people that Herbie and I had been smoking weed with and had been just living a sinful life with, um, God had been working in the lives of those people as well. Mm. And and so so now Herbie and I are like, we know that there's something more than Jehovah's Witnesses, right? And the people that we used to hang out with, that we're still friends with, one of them comes to faith. Mm. And so we we were we were all hanging together. We're all in this room together. And um this guy who had gotten saved, ironically enough, he's not a believer. He he never was a believer. Uh he's actually an atheist now. But wow. in, in the moment, right, because he, he kind of got saved at a Pentecostal church and he had this this said faith, right? He 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 didn't have authentic faith. But in the moment he was on fire for God. He, yeah. he would come in the room when we're high and he would say, you guys need to repent. You need to trust in the Lord. You need to believe. Um, and and I just felt convicted. I was like, man, there, there's, I need something more in my life. This isn't right. I'm not, I'm not right with God. Yeah. Um, and God used him. God used this unbeliever who we thought was a believer at the time to, to convict us and to convict me. And I remember, man, sorry, to, to let me just get to the point. I remember that. There was a time when I was outside of a friend's house and smoking um, um, a black and mild at the time, smoking outside. Um, I'd stopped smoking weed because it had made me hallucinate, you know, make me hallucinate and just bug out, you know. And so I stopped smoking weed. I'm smoking black and miles. And I remember being outside with my friends. And I remember saying, looking at the stars in the sky and looking at God's creation, thinking to myself, I'm done. I'm done with this lifestyle. I need Christ. I need mm. God. And I didn't know what that meant. Right. Yeah. And so um, I remember throwing, it was almost like a symbolic moment. I just threw, I just threw this black and mild and I associated with this lifestyle that I want to leave, that I want to abandon, that I don't want to be doing anymore. Right. I don't want to be having sex outside of marriage anymore. I don't want to be um, living this lifestyle that is opposed to God, but I don't know what that means. I don't know what that looks like. And yeah. so I, 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 I'm done with it. And then I reach out to this friend, Alex. I say, man, like, what are you? Like, who are you? Like, you look like you've changed. What what happened? And so he gives me a track. He gives me, you know, uh, oddly enough, a chick track. Um, <laughs> I knew it was a chick track. That's, it was a chick that's track, funny. right? I don't the know. Cartoon. I just had that feeling. <laughs> yeah. So he gives me this chick track. And at the end, at the, at the end of the chick track, there's this ask Christ into your life in the sinner's yeah. prayer. 
Yeah. And I remember, bro, praying. I'm reading this track, and I remember praying this sinner's prayer, right? Mm. And I'm I'm not in favor of a sinner's prayer, right? I I I my my you know regeneral what was it Gen- um, decisionism that whole thing. Uh, I have my yeah. thoughts about that now, right? And and yet God used this as a means. I remember being in my bedroom, and I have on my wall these Jet Magazine models that I would take out and put on my wall. I was a I was a womanizer. I was a, a you know, uh, and so I have all these women on my wall, and I and I remember reading this track, and and God is working on me, man. And I say I don't want to live this life anymore. Christ, please save me. And I, I believe you died for my sins, but I don't know what that means or looks like. I want to change my life. Save me. And bro, I, I believe that God saved me that day. Um, I, I threw out all my Tupac and Biggie CDs and locks and Nas and all that. And I actually gave them to a friend, which probably wasn't the wisest idea. I just <laughs> said, here, bro, I don't want these anymore. And yeah. he was like, I'll take it, you know, great. Yeah, right. And I took down the woman off the wall and I and I started, you know, going to church and hearing the gospel and, and starting to walk in obedience and all these things. And bro, that was maybe 15 years ago, you know, uh more or less, about 15 years ago. And I and I and I've grown since and I've um, you know, have educated myself on what the gospel is more and become more pronounced with it. And so, man. That's in a nutshell what my story is uh, in yeah. a roundabout way. Uh, that's what God did to save me. Dude, praise God! That is so good. I love I love testimonies. I, I just there's just yeah all different flavors and ways and how the Lord moves and how we react and respond and this and just like you don't know what this means and yeah it's right. so good. Uh, that's also side note why Jehovah Witnesses. Hi, you are being a very disobedient Jehovah Witness because I'm sure you know that they they want you in church, quote unquote, all the time and constantly telling you know this and you only can trust the Watchtower Society and on and on and on because they know there's all sorts of holes and they have to control the narrative. That's always a problem, and that's where I I, I often myself preaching and even just with <clears throat> doing channel and other things is like, yeah, let's do you have a problem? Let's go to the text. Let's go to God great let's let's there is a standard of truth there is something that is firm and foundational if there's an issue let's take it to that and not say oh don't ask questions no don't do that right. you can't do that don't read that person etc now there's you know there's some discretion there especially if you're a baby believer or something like that but yeah that's that's why the cults love to keep everybody in the dark because mm-hmm. you know, once you start asking questions it's like I don't, what if this is true oh no right, right. <laughs> that's oh praise god bro that's good. Um, the you mentioned that so you mentioned the rap. Just I, I know people are probably a little bit more curious. So then the woke stuff and there's overlap. You used to listen to rap. You got rid of the rap, but then you found Christian rap. And then same thing with the Justice, Tabidi, Anabuele, and Ch- Matt Chandler and uh, David Platt, some of these other guys. What then brought you out of? the woke Christian, even if you weren't like full fledged, uh, you know, Jamar Tisby or something like that, but something that you were like, Hey, there's justice. There's, we need these things. There is real racism. And of course there is, no one's denying that there isn't actual racism. Mm -hmm. The question is what is actual racism or to use the Bible term partiality? Um, what is partiality? What, what do we, and how are we supposed to solve this? Cause I mean, my own story with that, I mean, I had that a lot, especially working with uh, several different people. I sold phones in uh, seminary, d- during seminary uh, for Verizon. So it was a lot of downtime. And there were some guys, one guy was studying under Jarvis Williams, a very woke guy, for lack of a better word, at Southern Seminary. We had several conversations. This guy was also Hispanic. But he was like way more privileged than me. Like way more. Like his dad and his mom both worked. I think she was, it was like Cosby. Like he was a lawyer, she was a doctor or vice versa. Mm-hmm. And like he had loads of stuff. I mean, the guy got married and he had a huge wedding. And all Great guy, very friendly, very charismatic, he funny guy, great to get along with. But he would probably say he's woke or at least, you know, there's disparities and there's problem. And, you know, I have some sort of privilege. And yet, I mean, I didn't grow up poor by any means, but I, my parents certainly aren't rich, at least not to my knowledge. Uh, <laughs> they're still alive and they're both married and everything. But, uh, you know, I had problems too. We all, we all do have sin and problems and and circumstance, but it was just based on my skin tone, which was about the same color as his, except for, you know, our hair is slightly different. My eyes are blue, his are brown. 
but we had these conversations like, but how, what do we do? What am I supposed to do as a white man, white man, you know, and, and what are you supposed to do and how are we supposed to remedy this? And where does this fit in with Christ? How did you kind of morph into, and then I know are really more so come out of being for lack of a better word, woke. Yeah, that's a great question, man. And there's, there's a lot of, you know, back story and all that. So I'll try to summarize it, man. I was in a very dangerous place. Um, very dangerous. Uh, if, yeah. if things would have continued the way they were, it would have destroyed my marriage. Mm. Um, because my, my wife is not a person of color. And, and I use that term, you know, for those who, who adhere to that person yeah, of color, sure. right? Like sure. she wasn't black, she wasn't Hispanic, whatever that right. is. Right. Um, and, and so, um, and so my wife is, she's, she's white. Right. And she's, so she, so she has, um, everything that isn't enough. Like she's not, she doesn't know about the struggle and my background and, you know, what it means to be a person of color and all this. And so I, I that was the thinking I had in that time. And yet she, she, in, 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 in a lot of ways had a harder life than me. Um, you know, f- father was murdered and, uh, at an early age. And, and so that was my wife's background and I didn't have that background. And yet because of the color of her skin, um, she was the oppressor and I was oppressed. She represented uh. a people that were historically and currently oppressive to my people and right. my people being people who had more melanin in their skin. Um, and so there was these categories of oppressed and oppressor and, you know, um, you know, uh, systematic racism and all these terminologies. And so I, I embraced it. I embraced it wholeheartedly. And uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, there were people like Jamar Tisby um, and others who who I could trust theologically. And so the transfer is, you know, I, I can trust them, you know, in, in these matters as well. And so it almost ruined my marriage, man. I got introduced to Robin D'Angelo uh, oh, wow. from Jamar Tisby. Uh, and his podcast, uh, I got introduced to terminology like, um, you know, systemic racism and white privilege uh, from a truth table and uh, podcasts like that. I, I I started to imbibe the the uh, the worldview of Lecrae, you know, when he talked about uh, racism and systematic, you know, oppression and injustice and all these. So, so I was listening to all these things and all these people. I, I got heavily involved with James Cone. And started in in, wow. in 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 embracing his racist right. It's ironic, right? Because he's speaking about racism and he's the racist, right? right? And th- now that I look back and I see yeah. his content, I'm like, whoa, I believe that. And I and 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 ironically enough, man, I actually started working at a college that took me on it because I was Hispanic. I actually started working. Um, it was a tokenism. I'd gotten yeah. a job because I was Hispanic and I was the Hispanic. I was the coordinator for the Hispanic success center. Wow. Um, and I got that job because I was Hispanic. I couldn't speak Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. And yet I represented the image of the, the niche that the college wanted to meet. Right. So they wanted to get more Hispanics. And so, oh, we're going to hire a token Hispanic guy who's, friendly and interactive and he can, and, and, and the beginning of that job, I was woke. And so, yeah. you know, it, it, it fit perfectly, right? Here we are, you know, these are my people. And so I yeah. have this job now that suits and meets that need. And I was in a bad place, bro. Uh, I, I coached my wife on how she can uh, use her privilege as a white woman, as a, as a white person to, to help people of color. And so I, I coached my wife on, you know, when you see a black person in the store, you you need to, you know, uh, approach them as someone who is privileged and, you know, you need to help them out or seek how you can help them. But, you know, just a really ugly, nasty wow. place, man. Wow. Um, and my wife loved me and she's submissive and she, you know, uh, you know, it was like, OK, I, I don't see this, but, I, you know, I'll, I'll do that, you know, yeah. um, and all the while praying behind the scenes and all that. And so. In, in all that, bro, and there's a lot there, but in all that, one of the things that God used um, was several several things God used to, to take me out of that, to bring me out of that. Number one, I would post things on social media and I would get pushback. I mean, I would get pushback from people like, 
what do you mean? Like, this is a sweeping statement, brother. Like, how could you say that? Or, yeah. you know, that, that isn't true. Or, and there would be people from my former church in Florida who would say, Edwin, I'm sorry you feel this way. I don't know what happened to you. I don't know what's going on. Um, I don't, I don't know what's going on. And, and again, I would, I would be getting this information from the people I'd listened to from the books that I would read, that I was reading. Uh, I think one of the books was the next evangelicalism, um, you know, um, by, um, uh, I forget his name anyway, don't read it. It was a waste of time, but in the, in the <laughs> moment it was like, it was like, this is it. These are the answers I needed. Um, but I was getting pushback from a lot of people and, I obviously thought that they weren't getting it. They 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 were privileged and they they weren't understanding, you know, this whole concept of systematic racism, et cetera, et cetera. But then the other thing that God was using simultaneously was um this guy named A.D. Robles. You know, I, I come across his his YouTube channel and he's speaking against this woke ideology. And mm. this this, you know, he had an interview with uh uh KB and um his co host. And and they're talking about racism and you know um, all these discussions discussion points that I was thinking through, uh, and and I progressively followed AD and I'm like whoa like this guy I remember one time uh, I, I was getting ready for the work week it was like a Sunday and I think I was ironing I usually ironed all my clothes for the work week that day so that I'm you know have all my clothes for the work week and I just binged on AD I yeah. listened to AD and I'm like whoa. <laughs> and I remember going to my wife and telling her, I was like, I was like, boo, like, like, listen to this guy. And unbeknownst to me, my wife is quietly praising God because he, she was praying that, that God would open my eyes, that, that, yeah. that I wouldn't continue to believe these lies that I was embracing. And here she is listening to a man that is speaking against this worldview. And this is an answer to her prayer. Um, and then shortly after, I think I'd gotten into um, Just Thinking podcast, um, and and really from there, uh, John Harris and other people who started speaking out against it, and and man, all this, all these things that God used, yeah. um, and it just was like a light switch, right? I was when I was in the woke movement, it was foggy, it was dark, it was clouded. I was angry, I was resentful, I was bitter, I was all these emotions, right? And then, and then once, once the cloud had kind of been removed, it <clears> felt <throat> like my eyes had been opened again and there was joy and there was peace and there was connection points. Like I was asking better questions and thinking clearly. And, and, and now it just, it just, I, I'm no longer woke. I'm no longer woke. You know, I, I don't believe these things anymore. Like, ah, like I was blinded, <laughs> you know, but right now so. I see kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's really that bro. Yeah, no, that's that's incredibly helpful. And again, encouraging because you see not only like with the the uh, guy at the hospital, with the gold tooth and the grin and, hey, I got a tape for you um, to listening and asking questions. And then even here with your wife and uh, you have this relationship and you're followers of Christ, but then you're like, yeah, but there's sin in the world and how we deal with this sin and what should we do? And there is real oppression, but what is it and how do we deal with it? And yet prayer, opening your mouth, not just you, but the others around you. Uh, I mean, I take, I hope people take heart in that and encouragement because you don't know when you have that conversation with that person or you share that book. Hey, I just read this really good book. Or have you ever heard of this guy? He's really good. Or just this sermon is really, really helpful. Or this YouTube channel, this YouTube pay, uh, video page, whatever. And like, you're planting those seeds. You know, I yes. was very thankful for that. Uh, our church in Louisville, our pastor, professor at the seminary, great, humble guy. Um, and, you know, he, I would change some stuff personally about the church. But again, you know, I think we all would. But he, he always would talk about, you know, he had this two step forward, one step back kind of mentality in the Christian walk. That was one of the things he would, you know, routinely say. But the other thing was planting gospel seeds and, and not just, I think, for unbelievers, but even for believers, like you're saying, that people pushed against you and said, hey, hey, hey hold on. You know, and I think that's a lot of what you try to do with your channel. I try to do that with my channel and uh, even from the pulpit, at least I do. You probably do as well to say, listen, church. You know, talking to our audience, generally believers, not always, but we don't have to believe these lies and we don't have to just stay silent. You don't have to just let the person scream about X, Y, Z topical thing. 
and you not say anything. No, abortion is murder, period. Like it just is. It's not a choice. You know, ending a pregnancy isn't just a whatever. It's you're killing a human being. Like, and that's a problem, right? And I have issues with that. You have issues with me having issues. Well, great. I have issues with you. We're all in the same field here. It's not yeah. shut up, Christian, go back to your stained glass closet. It's I live in this world. I'm a citizen too. I have the rights given by God, uh, just like you do to speak your mind, even if it's foolishness and say something, do something, plant those seeds, uh, challenge those people and not just say, well, they're Mormon. He's a Jehovah witness. I, I can't do anything about it. Yeah. You know, even like you said, your friend who used to be a Christian and isn't, I often will say to people and you know, the Lord knows, but is he dead yet? Cause he's not yeah. a Christian yet. Well, you know, I mean, and there's, People all oh, lose your salvation, not and you know perseverance of the saints, all this other stuff. It's like, well, are they dead yet? Because they ain't right. dead yet, and they're not in Christ. Well, there's still time, <laughs> and so pushing for that person, like you said, with your wife, especially fervently praying for that person, is uh, it encourages me. It thrills me. I love it, uh, and I hope that encourages our our listeners as well because we need it. We need to hear. We need to hear it for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, Lastly, just kind of back to pastoral ministry. I know you said you you helped with the church plant, and then now you're in Western New York, being near family. And, and uh, again, our churches sound very similar, just trying to do the groundwork and trying to love these people and just observe stuff uh, and just kind of get the finger on the pulse what you're doing there. As a pastor, how do you both encourage your flock and even those listening um, to just live in the times that we're living. No, that's good, brother. So, so back to, to, to connect it with what I said earlier is I got I got in trouble as a Christian with this woke ideology. When I veered away from a biblical worldview, uh. um, I allowed the, you know, the, the, these individuals that I admired theologically had been affected by a non-biblical worldview. And they, they tried to, to wed the two. They tried to marry the two. And, um, you know, there, there was a, there was a disconnect and it showed in application, right? It showed in how I treated my white brothers and sisters that that isn't consistent with the biblical worldview. And so I, that's when I got in trouble. And so as a pastor who isn't woke now, Um, as someone who's uh, responsible for the flock that God has given me to be faithful in shepherding this flock and to, uh, to, to, to do that in my home and in my own life, I I need to be consistent in embracing and proclaiming a biblical worldview. Um, and, and that's the Christian life, right? We're we're called to renew our minds, to become more like Christ and the spirit of God uses the word of God to do that. And so I want to rightly divide the word of truth for God's people. Uh, I want to make sure that I'm preaching the text in context. So Peter is writing to a particular audience and, yeah. and, and we have many things in common and yet there's differences, right? He's writing to them. He's not writing to me, but this is for me as a believer. Yeah. And so there's application points that I need to to pull out from the text that are pertinent to the people that I'm I'm communicating to here at, at my local church. And so, um, you know, when it comes to uh, what's taking place in the culture, okay, uh, abortion or Black Lives Matter and and, and these different talking subpoints, I want to bring our people back to the Word of God. Okay, what does God say about life? What does God say about um, how we're to treat our neighbor and to love our neighbor? That has to be our driving force because, you you know what uh, even what Paul told uh, the Colossians right like don't be persuaded by yeah. these 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 philosophies and these ways of thinking that are contrary to the sufficiency of Christ yeah. right don't be deluded by these things Christ is enough Christ is sufficient and from that you 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 live your life in a way that is honoring and glorifying to God in the way he's called you to live. And so that's really, man, my, my driving point. You know, I, I veered away from that for a season. Thankfully I wasn't pastoring, uh, yeah. outside of my home, um, which, which by God's grace, the damage that was done, it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Uh, my children were younger when I was woke. Um, and so they remember less. Yeah. Uh, in fact, they don't, they don't remember any of the things that I had taught them. Uh, and, and I'm ashamed of this, bro. I look back just very quickly. I look back and, you know, we'd always have family time and family worship. And I remember 
going through a book and and specifically telling the kids, my my children, you know, Jesus wasn't this color, right? Th- this yeah. is something that they're doing. In I kind of do to, that too, though. <laughs> right, but well, but, for me, but for me, ahead. the image, the, the imagery was, um, Jesus wasn't this color. They're doing this intentionally to make you think he was white, oh, right? Okay. Um, and and that the, the, the my children can't wrap their head around that and thankfully they don't remember that um and so i want you know it doesn't mean i can't educate them and say okay jesus wasn't this color um you know he may have been darker and so on and so forth but i had a a woke spin to it Uh right because i i want i i i had this worldview that said for example this is another thing i told my i told my 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 daughter um that she was going to have a harder life because she was darker skinned then my son, who's lighter skinned, so my son is, uh, he has the complexion of my wife and my daughter has my complexion, which is darker, right? Uh, but but not that dark, but still darker, right? She's a person yeah. of color and so she's darker. And so I said, you're going to have a harder life um, because you're darker skinned and my son is going to have an easier life because he's lighter skinned. And, and that's just, that's, where is that in the Bible? Like what kind of biblical <laughs> worldview is that, right? Yeah, seriously. Um, and so, so, so now as a pastor, man, there are people who, who, who have tendencies in, in, in my congregation, um, that, that maybe are not woke, but, but they're, um, they're, they're different. And yet they veer away, right? They veer away from this biblical worldview. So I've got to, I've got to bring them back by way of, uh, exemplifying that in my preaching. Like, let, let's, Let's look at this text. Let's exegete it correctly. Let's apply it correctly. And that's how we're to live our lives in the culture. Like yeah. not being stirred by emotions and being driven by these tweets and these texts by these people who we trust or we think we should trust and these authority figures. Like, no, let's let's let the word of God be our driving force. That is how we think biblically. That's how we renew our minds. Let's rightly apply the scriptures and let the word of God be the final authority in our lives and how we dictate and how we live in this culture. And that's that's what we go back to. So that's really been the shift in my brain, bro. It's like going back to the word of God, the word of God. Amen. Amen. No, yeah, we de- we definitely need we need the text. Uh, what does it say? <laughs> what does the text say? And sometimes people will get uh, skeptics of that, both old and new. It's coming back around. It was very popular in the 40s, uh, 40, 50 years ago with conservative resurgence in the Southern Baptist convention and just kind of evangelicalism in general of people. Well, you're just worshiping the Bible. You're just, you know, it's yeah. the, the father, son and Holy scripture and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I understand where you're coming from. And if you have, if you're not paying attention and you just want to be emotive, then yeah, that, that make that argument makes sense. But no one does that in reality. No one listens, you know, reads a text from their wife or husband or reads a, an email from their boss and is dwelling on that text, the digital LED screen glowing back at them and be like, oh, I love my screen. This is my wife. And it's like no one thinks for a moment when they read a text from their wife that the text is their wife or anything else like that. It's rather a representation of her thoughts, her motives, her actions, etc. Well, the same thing with the word of God in a much broader way. It's God's word. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, we could, I could have a whole two hour conversation just about that um so yeah we need the text don't be blinded by that don't 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 let people think uh those listening especially think well maybe i maybe the word of god isn't enough maybe and that's the thing that we have for the hour it's not sufficient you know it's it's oh it's infallible it's inerrant absolutely is it sufficient though maybe 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 so right anyway it's very very good uh do you have any closing thoughts any words you want to add to it um, yeah, man, just, I, you know, as I, as I look back and see the, the, the progressions in my walk with the Lord, um, it, it's, it's all of God, man. It's all of, it's all of God from beginning to end. He, he, he awakened me, right? He, he opened my eyes. He, he raised me from the dead as it were. I was lost. I was blind. Uh, and, and he saved me. And, and, and in that process, man, he, he never let me go. And yet he let me, because of my own doing, uh, my own sin, my own idolatry, right? 
just growing as a believer, he he allowed me to go down some dark paths, um, right? Um, the 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 valley. He he allowed me to go down those, and um, he used those as opportunities for me to see his his grace and his 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 keeping power. So it was really, man, the spirit of God that has kept me throughout this process. So I would say, man, that as you're as you're growing as a Christian. Um, know that God's not done with you, um, and, and know that he's always working and that work isn't going to end. Um, it's going to continue until the day you die or until Christ returns. And so, so, so know that, but then also with that being said, um, the Holy spirit is, you know, this, this sanctification process is synergistic, right? God is working and, and you are to work. Right. And so I would say, make sure you're listening to the right people, right? Like who's, who, who's got your ear. If you're listening to worldviews that are antithetical to the Christian worldview, um, then, then don't be surprised if you start embracing some of their worldviews and some of their ideas. And so I would say, obviously, first and foremost, make sure you're involved in a, a healthy church, a place that sees the word of God as true and that, um, godly leaders and masculine men and people that want to be more like Christ. That's, vitally important for your Christian walk. And then make sure that you have people that love you enough to tell you the truth. I think of my wife. I think of um, people like AD, who was speaking the truth uh, to me from afar. And he didn't know I was listening, right? He, but he was faithful and he was doing what God had called him to do. And I, and I think we need that in our lives and we need to be that for others in mm-hmm. our lives. Um, and so uh, wh- whatever, whatever gifts or talents or time that you have, do whatever you do for the glory of God. And, and God is working, right? God is at work. So I would say, you know, uh, the spirit of God is working and, and, and you and I are to be diligent over our souls, over our lives, continually evaluating, man, am I believing the right things? Am I giving God glory with the way I'm living my life and really doing an inventory check to make sure that we're on the path and we're not being deceived. Um, and, 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 praying that God would bring people into our lives that would tell us the truth. Like, Hey, E like you bugging, right? You all out right now. Like you're, you're saying things that are not consistent with the biblical worldview. If I didn't have that brother, if I didn't have those kinds of people in my life, my marriage would be destroyed. Right. I'm, I, you know, I, I'm convinced of it. If, if AD and, and, um, uh, I think of another brother, um, uh, Mike, uh, Michael Griffin had come into my life, uh, um, Michael Foster. Uh, these are people that were that were really God was using uh, in different ways in my life that that man saved me from a dark, you know, progressing into a really dark time. Uh, and they didn't know it. Right. They, and, and a lot of it, they didn't intentionally know that I was into this. And yet their their example, their ministry, their um, their podcast, their blogs, whatever. Right. Their their pushback. All that helped me in this journey. So, so that would be my closing thoughts, man. Um, yeah. And, and just keep looking to Christ, keep looking to Christ. He's sufficient. Yeah. Amen. No, that's, that's wonderful. I, it, yeah. <laughs> Look to Christ. I mean, that's really, that's, that's it, you know? And, and again, sometimes we think it's so simplistic or redundant, but at the end of the day, it is pretty simplistic. It is, it is uh, basic. You know, sometimes we muddy the water so much with all sorts of other things. So anyway, I appreciate your time, brother. Uh, I really do. I hope this was helpful for those listening, uh, watching and go check out Edwin uh, on Proverbial Life. He's got he's got a ton of content on YouTube. Uh, it's the Proverbial Life. You do you're still running your blog? You said do you still have a website, correct? Yep, I still have the website uh, writing, you know, occasionally on there. And that's uh, the proverbial life dot com. But for real life.com. Perfect. Yep. So yeah, go check him out. Uh, I've benefited from his work. I'm sure, I'm sure some of the audience listening now already knows you, but there's certainly some that have not uh, been introduced yet. So again, I hope this was helpful and I appreciate you sharing your testimony and just how you were in and out of the wokeism and just glorifying God in the whole process, brother. It's, it's good to look back and see where we've been and where we're going. So Amen, yeah, brother. thank you. That's it. Take care. Thank have you, brother. God bless. All right. See you.